Uh, for those that already know everything, tune back in in 10 minutes. For those that don't, um, just listen and ask all the questions you want. Uh, feel free to interrupt me in between if you don't, if, if you just miss the train. It's really frustrating to stay in a seminar and not being able to follow anything because you just missed the first five minutes. So we're going to talk about VGE, that is venous gas emboli, or bubbles. We're going to talk about how they form, how we measure them, how we have measured them in the past, what happened since, and where we're trying to go. Uh, then I'm going to talk about all the projects I'm currently running, and that is some of it is physiology, some of it is public health, so big data, trying to collect as much data as we possibly can. Um, a new one is on variability. That is uh, my personal favorite, and it's going to be very complex and very complicated, and I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I'm going to talk about DecoBubbles, which is an initiative that you might or might not have heard about in the past year or two. Um, during COVID, we needed something to do, so we decided uh, to have people, normal people, divers, non-divers, count bubbles for us. And that worked out pretty well, and I'm going to tell you how you can do that too, if you really don't have anything else to do. Okay, so VGE production, for those that were in Dr. Nocetto's and the uh, Berman's talk this morning, you already heard a lot about that. I'm going to sum it up real quick. So you obviously know the phases of the dive. You compress, you stay isobaric somewhere at depth, and then you come up. Well, ideally, that's the square profile that everyone has kept researching. Obviously, that doesn't happen that way. But let's consider a wreck dive. So we're going down, we're breathing compressed gas. Whatever is in that gas, the oxygen in it, which you ho hopefully have in it, otherwise you won't breathe too, too long, um, will get metabolized. But the inert gases that don't get metabolized will form or will saturate into your tissue. So the gas will diffuse. Your tissues will absorb it, and that keeps going all the way on the bottom until you decide to ascend again. And once you ascend, um, the pressure decreases, and that can cause bubble formation. So the gas comes out of your tissue, it diffuses back into the bloodstream, and whatever this gas finds in the bloodstream that it can nucleate from, it will use that to form bubbles. These decompression bubbles are also caused, uh, called venous gas emboli. That is what I'm going to talk about. So you will either hear me say bubbles or VGE, which is exactly the same thing for our purposes here. And they are a sign for decompression stress. They are not a sign for decompression sickness. And that is a very important um, distinguishment. So how can we see those? They can be visualized using ultrasound. And that is either Doppler ultrasound, so audio, or it is um, visual ultrasound with 2D echocardiography. The VGE are correlated with DCS, but that link is not really clear. So although everyone knows well, open water course, if you heard anything about bubbles, is that they are bad and that they cause DCS. It's not that simple, unfortunately. Um, they may present without DCS symptoms, and that's good for you. And VGE are a primary trigger for inflammatory processes. So you heard me talk about those um, uneven surfaces in uh, in blood vessels and all cell debris and um, microparticles that float around. So all those basically get, get triggered by bubble formation or the other way around. We really don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg for that bubble production. Um, and these inflammatory processes can cause decompression sickness symptoms too, or cause decompression sickness. So this makes it all a bit more complicated. The definite treatment, and you've heard all about it if you were here um, for the last hour, 
is we want to decrease bubble size with hyperbaric oxygen treatment. And then we also want to replace that excess nitrogen that is in the bubbles by putting more oxygen in it. And that means the bubble content will diffuse into the bloodstream, the oxygen will diffuse into the bubble, and the bubble will shrink. That's the theory. That is the very easy physics idea. And then comes all that inflammation part, and it all becomes very complicated again potentially induces anti-inflammatory response. This is something that seems to be a given. Everyone is talking about anti-inflammatory response through oxygen. What people usually don't know is that oxygen can also cause inflammatory response. So it is a very fine scale where we are and what we do with the oxygen in the system. And again, that makes it more complicated. I'm going to talk about a few more headaches that scientists have with decompression research, um, just hang on. So decompression sickness is basically those bubbles that we just talked about, and we know now where they come from, but they're in the wrong spot. So somehow they made it into an organ that didn't want bubbles and that can't function if bubbles are stuck in it and uh, perfusion doesn't happen anymore. Usually that happens through right to left shunting mechanisms. And there are two distinguished ones. One is the PFO, Peyton Foramen Ovale, that you've all heard about. And another one are EPAVAs, or lung shunts. And that is something that some people know and some people don't, and some people just ignore. So when someone presents with DCS, the first, one, the, the first thing to do is usually, have, have you been checked for a PFO? Uh, you should. And it's usually a good indication um, that there is actually a PFO, and in many cases, that is exactly what happens. Um, the PFO is a hole, an opening, and it can be a really big opening, or it can be a really small opening, or it can have a flap over it that just opens with pressure changes. So most of them are usually closed. 30 to 40% of the population have one and never have any issues with it. Until they go diving and make a Valsalva maneuver and change intrathoracic pressure, and all of a sudden it, it opens and pushes bubbles from the right side, where they are okay, to the left side, where they shouldn't be. Size, opening pressure, highly individual. So even if you have one, you might never have an issue while diving. EPAVAs, or intrapulmonary arteriovenous anastomosis, and you can safely forget that. I'll, I'm going to call them lung shunts from here on, um, are basically um, blood vessel, extra blood vessels that can open and close when your lungs get overwhelmed, too many bubbles, um, heavy exercise, you need more oxygenation, but your lung can't function anymore, so those, those shunts might open and let oxygen-deprived blood through. And in this case, when you have been diving, it will also let the bubbles through. Now you think, well, is there, is, how do I know if I have that? And the thing is, you don't. There was a study in 2013 where they looked at 24 people, they strapped them to an exercise bike after diving. Um, they knew those people had bubbles in the system. They even injected bubbles in one of those studies into the bloodstream to see whether at a certain VO2 max, that is oxygen uptake while exercising, um, so the percentage of VO2 max some of them arterialized at rest, so without even doing any exercise. A third of them never arterialized. This is a test that is very, um, very invasive, and you really don't want to do that. Obviously, this was done on military divers. Who else? Um, <laughs> they're usually voluntold. They don't sign informed consent. They get informed about their consent. So. Um, 
three of those at rest. What I find scary is, are these. Four arterialized at 20 to 39% of their VO2 max, and that is light thinning back to the boat, climbing the boat ladder, things like that. That could cause arterialization of the bubbles you just collected when coming back onto the boat from your dive. Now, while this sounds all scary, and now you, please don't stop diving because I'm telling you this, um, there is a, we, we need to talk about bubblers and non-bubblers for a while, because there is um, this understanding that the more bubbles you have, the higher is your likelihood that you actually get decompression sickness. And that is pretty well, um, pr pretty well described in the literature, and uh, a lot of projects have been done on that. So I, I tend to believe this, or we, we just take it as a given. Now, if we have less bubbles, so lower grades, you still have a DCS probability, but it's not that high. But then the question is, if I don't find any bubbles in you after a dive, so I come to the quarry, or to the boat, or where, wherever you guys dive, and I say, look, 20 minutes after the dive, and 40, and 60, and 80, I'm gonna measure you, and we'll see if you have bubbles. And then I measure, and I say, I can't find anything. Are you safe? I say no, but I don't have a good reason why I say that, because we don't have the data to support it. We just say, okay, we go with the lowest risk. We, you're still not safe. You might still have decompression sickness, although I didn't see any bubbles. Now, with this in mind, if I reduce the bubbles with whatever I can do to do that, that would decrease my probability of getting DCS, correct? Logic. Okay. So, luckily, a lot of scientists around the world have talked about this and done studies on it. Uh, a big one was done in, yeah, about 10 years ago, uh, 10 to 15 years ago in Nemo, a deep pool in Belgium. Uh, and they focus on the reduction of bubbles by doing something before the dive that will reduce bubbles after the dive. Now, what could that be? Mechanical stress, so they, there was a, a, a story that was told that, um, so we, we never see any bubbles if we take the speedboat out. If we go with the, with the normal, like the, the old fisherman boat, we, we all bubble like crazy. But if we take the speedboat out to the, to the dive site, we never bubble. So the hypothesis was the mechanical stress of sitting on the speedboat on the rib and being shaken before the dive would, for, would somehow release those nuclei and they wouldn't be there anymore after the dive to give bubbles a chance to form. Took it into the pool, didn't take a speedboat into the pool, took vibration mats instead, and proved that that was actually the case. Well, they didn't really prove that it was that denucleation that happened, might have been, um, other mechanisms that caused it, but they did find less bubbles after that treatment, after the dive, than normal. Exercise goes in a similar direction, and what you need to know, so there's always a discussion, has been for 20 years now, how much exercise can I do before a dive? The answer is, it's very individual, just for you, and you will have to find out yourself. But, on study populations that we have worked with before, something like two hours before the dive, high intensity exercise for 10 to 15 minutes seems to be okay. Marathon 24 hours before is not okay. So anything in between is where you can play. Okay? Um, Heat stress and sauna goes into a similar direction as the mechanical stress and the vibration or sound. Um, a bit of that might be the lymphatic system being, uh, being activated, but again, not much to prove that at this point. Getting there, talking about that variability study at the end of this that I'm so excited about. And then um, oxygen pre-breathing, that's a no-brainer that that would work. 
Now keep in mind, depending where you want to go in the dive, you might not want to get all that oxygen in before, depending on the depth and the gas you're going to breathe during the dive. So this is not a safe bet, but it seems to work. Um, this is the don't try that at home advice now. And uh, hyperhydration works, but has different other side effects. I mean, hyperhydration, urination, and feeling really uncomfortable, and more pressure on the heart because there's more fluid that needs to, to go through, and the risk of immersion pulmonary edema, and all those things. So don't hyperhydrate, but do hydrate. And good hydration starts 24 hours before the dive. Everyone here, I assume, knows that and doesn't do it anyway, because we're all human. Um, make, set alarms, um, make whatever you can, make it easy for you. Uh, put water bottles around your house everywhere. Every time you see one, just take a sip. It doesn't have to be much, but you want to get to two liters per day and then add another half to one liter, and I, I really don't. And someone tell me what that is in Imperial. Well, you get the message, I guess. Um, so add another half liter to a liter for each hour you want to dive the day. And then medication or um, supplementation has been worked with. So in this case, it is we have antioxidative pills that were taken. That doesn't really help with bubble formation, we found. It does help your blood vessels, though, really smooth afterwards. Same with chocolate. So one of the supplements was dark Belgian chocolate. It had to be Belgian, obviously. My last boss was Belgian. He insisted. Um, and anticoagulants, anticoagula so uh, blood thinners, worked. And again, don't try this at, home. this at home. This is just for information purposes at this point. Until Dan puts out a a regimen that you can follow. Please don't follow what I'm just saying. I'm just telling you here. Um, so I talked about headaches that I have when I think about decompression research. So challenge number one, it is descriptive. What do I mean by that? So we can measure bubbles before. We can measure bubbles after. There is no easy, feasible way to do it during the dive where I really would want to know when they form and where and why. But that's currently very impractical to impossible. There is an individual outcome for everyone. So we have the people that always bubble after the dive. And while 10 years ago that wasn't me, now it is. I'm always champagne when I come out of the water and I haven't found a real reason for it yet. Makes me more curious to keep working with this. Uh, we have non-bubblers that apparently never have any bubbles. And then we have these inconsistent ones, and they are the real nightmare. You never know. So you measure them five days in a row, and the first day they bubble like crazy, and the second day there's nothing, and the third day the bubbles are back. I don't know. So if I don't find any bubbles on you, and we had this this, I come to the quarry and I measure all of you. Uh, so one thing could be, I might just be really bad at acquiring those data. So what people try to do now is they take various devices into the field and say, oh, I didn't see anything. Well, did, did you know where exactly to look? And have you, what is, what is your ultrasound education? Have you gone through any courses recently? Usually not. So now that it's so easy to get all those devices, don't jump on it. Don't buy them right away off the shelf and try, try your luck. If you want to know how they work, we do um, take volunteers at Dan and we teach them how to acquire that data. It's not, easy, not, not an easy online course, though. It takes a lot of practice and everyone is different. And I might, I might get good readings on 60, 70% of you. And then there's just physiology that is less favorable, say, and I'm not looking at anyone now. Um, the challenge number two is possibility, is there a possibility for a bubbler test? So now that I've talked about this, you might or might not be bubbling. 
is there really something like a non-bubbler? If I just put them in the water for long enough or decompress them rapidly enough, shouldn't everyone be a bubbler? But however much exercise or sauna or whatever you did before the dive? Haven't figured that out yet. I believe it's just a matter of exposure. And during the last uh, expedition with the Britannic divers uh, in, in September, so a month ago, we did have bubbles on every single diver. That is a almost 400 foot dive though. And the decompression um, profile is about five hours long for 20 minutes on the bottom. So to, yes, it's a question of exposure. If that pertains to you dive to your diving, I don't know. I can't tell. Um, if we wanted to test this, would we have to put you in the same dive once, twice, what kind of dive? One dive, five dives? Have to figure that out. Um, and then the question is, would you actually want to know? And if you do, if you ever sign up for my studies and we come to you or you come to North Car to beautiful North Carolina and uh, dive our uh, local waters, then uh, I will ask you, so if I find that you have large amounts of bubbles and, and you might even materialize, what, what would you do? What would you change in your diving if you know that? And I want an answer from you before I put a probe on you. Challenge number three is diving subjects. So what subje subjects do we have? Obviously, we would want to work with those that have decompression sickness right away, but we're never there when that happens. When they call the, med the medical hotline, decompression is on underway. There's, I mean, I'm not flying to Socorro to put a probe on someone 24 hours later. That doesn't make any sense. So what can we do? We can do all of this retrospective. So we can ask people, what did you do? What was your dive? What was your exposure? What was your, what was the gases? Is it for me? Okay. Um, how many decompression sickness hits have you had before? Because you, if someone gets it once, it is more likely that you will get it a second or a third time. Um, if nothing gets changed or fixed in between. Um, and in this one, the most complicated one is that human factor that everybody lies. People will not tell you what actually happened. And they will try to, to, to hide their dive computers or give you the one that they didn't take <laughs> or the one that their buddy took who hadn't, the, hadn't had the rapid ascent or the one they, they tied to a coral on the way in and then picked it back up on the way out. So it's, it, it's not easy to get that information. So it's unreliable. We're still trying to get it, but it is more unreliable. Um, and then obviously there is military diving as a population, and then there's recreational diving as a population. You just look left and right of you who, who qualifies as a Navy SEAL, not too many, right? So how much of that information that we get from the 30 years of 30, 40, 50 years of military diving research is actually applicable to a crowd like this and myself included? We do want a homogeneous cohort. What I mean by that, we usually take out a lot of the information um, or we, we exclude a lot of people like, okay, someone with a BMI over 30, we can't, we can't work with that. Or smoker, yeah, no, that's uh, two smokers and 20 non-smokers, can't, can't really do any statistics with that. Sorry, you're out. But we do want a, an average of the diving community, so we need to include all those. In research, we need to, so you either end up excluding a ton of people and then have very specific mechanisms that only work in that cohort you've just worked with, worked with. Or you end up having to recruit 100, 150, 
200 people to make conclusions and assumptions in the end that might work for a wider audience. Knowing all this and all those headaches that I have and all the challenges, we obviously have recommendations for you. If you know you bubble or if you know you're an easy shunter or you've had decompression sickness before and you didn't get your PFO fixed, so what can you do? You can consider something like low bubble diving. And that is obviously you can dive shallower. And all the tech divers in the room will now say, yeah, pfft, right. You, you, me too. Um, you can use nitrox. Again, the tech divers will say, well, I'm playing with gases all the time anyway, so what, what are you talking about? Um, but yes, for purely recreational, fun diving, you can change to a different mix. You can set your computer to air, have that extra oxygen safety margin as long as you stay in your, in, in your MOD. Make it a habit to ascend really slow and practice that on every dive, please. That is the, I think that is the, the most important that came out of all that dive computer research and the, the introduction of dive computers into the recreational diving community is that people actually saw, oh, I'm really too fast, I die. Okay, I'll, I'll slow down. And that cut decompression sickness cases in half, if not more. Avoid deco dives. Again, I'm not talking to you tech divers now. Um, prolong your safety stop. If you have the training for it, add oxygen to the safety stop. Two dives a day can be enough. But I'm on the liverboard and I can't be the iron diver if I don't do five dives a day. Well, think about that for a minute. That certificate might look great in the hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> Increase the surface interval between dives, but I have to do five dives. I can't have. <laughs> Please. Please. Some common sense. Uh, avoid exertion after the dive. And this is important. So, whatever you do, mechanical stress, um, exercise, carrying heavy tanks, and this is a really good excuse to not tamper with your dive gear afterwards and let someone else carry, a, the, carry the doubles out of them. Um, avoid anything that could dislodge more bubbles for an hour, two, three after the dive. And again, we talked about that. Stay hydrated. Be hydrated before and start rehydrating right after the dive. You do lose a lot of um, humidity through dry air. And then keep in mind, who are you diving with? So is your, bu your body exactly the same physique and phenotype as you are? I can say for me, usually not. Um, so they have the same fitness level. Are they, do they have the same training? Do they have the same mindset? Do they want to go into the same restrictions you, that you want to go through? Uh, are they the same age? Um, how long did you both sleep last night? Did you have more drinks than him or her the night before? So all that factors in. And you need to, need to make sure that not only you are safe, but your buddy is too. So talk about things like that. Um, the way we have been looking at bubbles is we've tried to hear, to listen to bubbles with Doppler audio. And that is where um, in early experiments you would have someone with a probe that is placed somewhere here on the chest. And you listen and you hear the bloodstream and you also hear those blip noises in between. And that is bubbles. It takes a lot of training to actually hear that. So smart people, much smarter than me, have started to automate that grading. So you don't have to develop that, that Doppler ear. Um, you can actually just put it through an automated system and it will tell you, OK, you were a grade 2 or a grade 3 or a grade 0 on that dive. We've since progressed to being able to see the bubbles. And that is using cardiac um, echo or using echocardiography. So 
visualizing all four chambers of the heart at the same time. And then you would want to see the bubbles only on one side, and that is the right side of your heart. Why is that? Because if it's on the left side, it will go in all your tissues and will, distrib will be distributed, and that might get you that decompression hit that you don't want. <coughs> there are different scales how uh, we have talked about this in the past. And I guess I'm, I either took it out or it comes later, but the most used is the eftedal brubach scale, which goes from zero no bubbles at all, to a four to five, which is basically a white out. You can't distinguish bubbles in there anymore. For anyone who's interested in that, I have all those videos, different uh, variations on my computer. So if you, if you want to see something like that, I'm happy to provide that. We currently are collaborating with the University of North Carolina, Duke University, um, the University of California, San Diego. And we're all trying to automate detection of venous gas emboli. And that is audio Doppler, and it is visual 2D ultrasound. Um, what we're trying to do is to create a, a network or a platform where you just upload the video or the audio file and then it gets measured or it gets graded for you and you just get out the information you need. This is going to be interesting for those that until now had to look, um, had to actually go through every single frame of that video and count bubbles and go to the next frame and count bubbles. Now we have worked on a computer algorithm to do that for us and artificial intelligence and we're getting there, we're not quite there yet. Um, we also try to find the right tool for the job. So you've all seen the smaller devices that can easily uh, be bought. But, so this one is the butterfly probe, connects to an iPad or an iPhone or an Android phone. And the great thing about it is it's only $2,400 plus a marginal subscription fee for, and then you can take your own videos. Please don't. The quality is really not as good as I hoped it would be, because we have been carrying these into the field for years, decades, and it's really bulky and it needs a lot of electricity, and I, I really wanted something handheld like this. There's four or five others on the market at the moment, similar quality at this point. Um, I really wanted that because traveling with that, cabin luggage, people don't like me when I, when I pull up with that in security. This one would have been easier, but at this point I can't say many good things about it, unfortunately. It is great for pre-hospital emergency care. It is not good for diving research, what we want to do. This is what these bubbles can look like when they go through the right side of the heart, which here is the left. So just picture me standing here. So this is my right side. This is my left side. That is why you see this as the right side of the heart. This is the grading scale that was commonly used. Um, as I said, after Dalbrubach, visual observation, no bubbles, occasional bubbles all the way to white out, where you can't really, yes. Say again. Um, so for, so for the, this is a great question because we need several measurements if we want to take it serious, several uh, measurements after the dive. And we want something like 20 seconds or at least 10 heart cycles that we can count in 10 heart cycles and then get a, an average of the numbers we get there. And yeah, I'm, I know my last bubbles usually decay after three hours. So every 20 minutes, three hours, take another one and another one and another one. Right. Um, so now 
with the grades, you can't really do much in statistics. You can say, oh, this is more than that. And that's about as far as the statistic will go. Now, counting and having accurate numbers, so here you would see 32 bubbles in this picture, um, which we all counted by hand slash by eye up to now, and we still do that to feed our algorithm. Um, but this will actually give us a, a means of running statistics with it. So how much does it decay over time? Not just from a grade five to a grade three, but from 32 bubbles to an average of five after two hours. Um, what we have tried over the pandemic, because no one had anything to do and everyone was sitting at home and no one wanted to, wa to watch our webinars anymore, so we came up with decobubbles.com. Decobubbles.com, here it is again. All right, so what we did is we have monitored a lot of divers. So we have a ton of videos. Those videos needed to be stopped at some point, and then when all the valves are open, you start counting, and then you go to the next frame, and you start counting, and you go to the next frame, and you count. So every video would take me about five minutes to get through. That's a lot of time when you consider just for myself, I would take something like 10 videos after my dive, so that's already an hour gone just for analyzing mine. And then we want big data, so we want a lot of people to measure. So you can imagine how frustrating this can be after a while. So we created this website. <clears throat> we, as of yesterday, have 250 writers, 251, one of them is me. About 10 of them are my team <laughs> that has been, been pl playing with this since the beginning. And we have um, these people submit ratings. So we have them create a login, it's your email address. We don't know anything about you. We don't even, we don't connect the email address to anything, not even IP addresses. We just, um, so you register, you log in, and then the first thing we have you do is watch a training video, which is eight minutes long. And that tells you everything you need to know to do basic bubble counting in those videos. Then we have you click a few, but we know where the bubbles are, but you don't yet. And then we see if your rating or your counts agree with our counts. And once you've succeeded in three of those, we send you into the database and you can go to rate video at any time. And from the videos that are currently in there, at the moment there are 209. In the next two or three weeks, we're going to upload another 400. Um, you can rate the videos, and whatever you rate gets submitted to us. We wait until three people have rated the same video. We see what the agreement is. If it all agrees, that one is rated. We keep all the time points in there, and that gets fed into an algorithm in our artificial intelligence. And hopefully, by the end of next year, we will have enough of those videos that our artificial intelligence is smart enough to know where the heart is and what bubbles are, and we don't have to do that anymore, and that might even work in real time. But we can be hopeful, I guess. Um, what we also try to do is make it a bit of a challenge. So unfortunately, in the last uh, four months, I haven't been writing a lot. So this is my score, and this is the top writer. Someone really, really had a lot of time on their hands. Um, but we're really, really happy that so many people are actively doing this. And um, yeah, if you want, please click. If you just rate one video, that is already help. I know one person write it, rated all 209 and then sent us an email if he could write more. I really like that. Um, what we also have is uh, research that we don't do in-house. We actually talk to um, the University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill, and they have a complete section that only works with ultrasound, also um, ultrasound in other medical treatments. So what they work on is safety considerations using cardiac ultrasound in supersaturation. So am I actually disturbing anything when I put a probe on someone who's supersaturated? Am I popping anything? Am I 
inducing decompression sickness. Doesn't look like it at the moment. Um, can ultrasound before a decompression be used to manipulate those micronuclei I talked about and then be used as a preconditioning to reduce bubble scores after? We don't know yet, but we're working on it. And we're constantly trying to adapt the existing ultrasound technology for in vivo collaboration. So what they find out is what we take back to the quarry and we try to, to replicate what they have in their gels and mice and whatever else they measure. What we also try to do now, and this is another project that will start soon, is we try to find a connection of bubbles and actual DCS cases. So we have one chamber we're working with um, where we're going to measure VGE before they go into the chamber when they present with DCS and afterwards. What we expect to see is a, redu is a reduction. What we really hope for is that we see a relationship between the bubbles and DCS onset and the decay of bubbles and the DCS getting better. Not too hopeful for it though. We hope, but given that we're only taking one measurement before and then one after, not sure we can draw those conclusions in the end. Um, and what we're also going to do is working with another university um, in the US to collect biospecimen that they can, uh, or blood samples that they can analyze for microparticles. Very hot topic. Um, big data collection has been done in the past for about 10 years. Project Dive Exploration was on the market. You might or might not have heard of or contributed to it. 200,000 dives were collected, 120,000 or so were um, actually included in the, in the final analysis. And I think it is time for a version 2.0 because 10 years ago, 20 years ago, not everyone had a computer with Bluetooth. Bluetooth wasn't a, th a thing yet, but now everyone has computers and everyone has a cell phone. So it would be the easiest in the world to develop the app to just get that information. And some manufacturers are already doing that. And I'm going to have a quick chat with Shearwater today. And uh, maybe we can get something running in that direction. Then Europe has not been sleeping either. They are still work, still collecting. Um, for them, it's not project dive exploration, but it's very similar. Dive safety guardian is what they call it. And they have collected 40,000 uh, dives and are continuing. This is ongoing. Um, and then that is what I'm excited about. Only going to take two minutes. Um, this is going to be a very complex project. Why is this going to be complex? Uh, because we're looking at individual bubble variability. So we're going to have people do no decompression dives, the same one again and again and again and again. We will look at the bubbles after that dive compared to other people doing the same dive, but also compared to what was it last week and what is it next week. Why are we doing that? Because tables and dive computer don't know what you did last night. So it's always difficult for us. Uh, the prescribed dive profile is going to stay in, in no decompression limits. It's probably going to end up with a surface gradient factor around 40. And it is open circuit, no decompression limit, air. And you cannot dive between those six dives that we want you to do over six weeks. This is where it gets complicated because instructors will say, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and people that actually work will say, yeah, how, how am I exactly going with? So we know this is challenging, but we're still looking for volunteers. And this is going to go on for the next three to five years. So whenever you have six weeks, six weekends in a row where you don't want to want to dive in between, let us know. We can make almost anything possible for this. Um, aims are to determine if some divers are just more prone to having, DC, uh, to having VGE or not. Assess the variability post-dive between people, between you each week, 
so just inter and intra variability. And we're collecting a lot of other things. So we'll have a medical questionnaire in the beginning, but then also a weekly compliance check. So did you really not dive? And what else did you do? And how, much, how many cigarettes did you dive? <laughs> did, did you, did you did, um, smoke? And so on. Plus a dietary recall for the last 12 hours. We do believe that nutrition has something to do with it. Can't really put the finger on it yet. Um, obviously, we're going to do echoes pre and post dive. We're going to collect the dive profile to see that you actually did what we asked you to do. Um, we'll do pre and post dive cardiac monitoring, so EKGs, just to be on the safe side, blood pressure, heart rate, and so on. Anthropometrics, so looking at um, body density. I think what we can call it. Um, we're looking at hydration and we're looking at stress and inflammation through saliva samples. So it is worth going when you when you come to the dive site every week. We, we will keep you uh, engaged for about a day. It's a neat little protocol. I hope we will have something that we can do with this. And I hope that the next time DEMA is happening in Vegas, and we hope it will, that I have preliminary results for this. Right, so who is Dan Research? At the moment, it's a really small crowd. I have poached people from other parts of the world and around, so some interns that have since left but are still collaborating poached uh, our medic here from another department who's, um, who's helping every now and then. I have external collaborators and we have a lot of other people that are helping as they can, but we still have a few spots open, so if you want to join the team, you can apply as a summer intern, as a senior scientist, depending on what you want to do and what you can do. Research, we're looking for a research associate at the moment, and we are going to introduce a research sabbatical, um, hopefully in the next year or in 2023. So if any of that sounds good to you, let me know, give us a call, or send us an email. And with that, I'm at the end, and Camilo has five minutes to set up, so I guess questions would have to be taken outside. Thank you.